morning she was 17, and I'm still three years older than her, even though she acts older than me. <laughs> but we began to date, and we began to court, and that's still a word today, I hope, right? And we were on the same path. We were headed in the same direction. We loved Jesus. We were passionate about God. We were passionate about all the things that God had for us. I don't know that she was very passionate about my hairline at that time. <laughs> In fact, I know she wasn't. And I, know, I don't think that she was really passionate about becoming a pastor's wife. I won her over by my winning personality. But the thing was is that we were equally yoked. And to yoke, it means to be joined together to something. And so, when it, it's so it's so important when you hear the phrase, it's actually in the Bible, to not, to be, to not be unequally yoked with others because you're not, you don't want to be joined to others that you're not, not, like, you're not like-minded with. I believe, and that's another, that's another story, that's another sermon. But what, this morning as we look at this word, yoke, what does yoke mean? And so I looked up in my handy-dandy dictionary, and I found out what the word yoke actually means. And yoke is a device for joining together a pair of animals like oxen. It's a wooden, it's a wooden instrument that is placed on the shoulders of one ox, and the other ox is placed next to him, and then it has ropes and chains so that they could pull something, and they are yoked together, or two mules together. They are yoked to, together. Another definition for yoke is a frame fitting the neck and shoulders of a person for carrying a pair of buckets or carrying a burden. Yoke is also a symbol of slavery, like an archway under which prisoners of war were compelled to pass by the ancient Romans. Yoke means something that binds together. It is also a verb, meaning to join, to couple, to harness, to link, to unite, to attach. A yoke is something that places the destiny of a man in the hands of the enemy. Think about that this morning. A yoke is something that places the destiny of a man or a woman in the hands of the enemy. And as it pertains to our lives and being in Christ, a, satan a yoke is a satanic instrument of oppression used to limit a person's growth, their promotion and fulfillment, or their breakthrough. It is a hindering barrier. And so this morning, you've heard it said, and you've, and you've, and this, it, when you, when we, when you hear this said, it's making reference to Isaiah chapter 10, that the anointing breaks the yoke of bondage, and it destroys, annihilates the yoke of bondage. What are some yokes of bondage that you and I may face even this morning as we're sitting in this service? One of those yokes could be, and I, we're still in the introduction, so don't get, don't get happy yet, but one of those yokes could be a yoke of unbelief. Several weeks, a month ago or whatever, I spoke on a Wednesday night. There's a thief in your house, and it's called unbelief. And unbelief is robbing folks from everything that God has for them. We believe in Jesus, but we don't believe he can really do all the things he says he can do. And so a yoke of unbelief plagues us, and it keeps us trapped from getting to where God is trying to take us in our lives. A yoke of unbelief. Another yoke could be a religious yoke. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, a, a, a yoke of legalism, a yoke of religiosity, that is a yoke that's plaguing the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Who says you have to wear long skirt and no makeup? Hello? Who says you, have, you can't cut your hair? Who sa there's a, a, a religious yoke is all these man-made religious rules we should, be, we should dress modest, and we should have put on some deodorant. Come on, somebody. Amen? I mean, that's, that's, that's a yoke that stinks when you don't wear deodorant. Another yoke of bondage that you and I maybe face, and we sing about it, we worship God, and some of the verbiage in those songs this morning, some of them was this, fear. Many folks have a yoke of fear. There's 365 do not fear, fear not statements in the Bible. That's one for every day of the year. And but why does fear, why is fear such a huge thing in the lives of believers? In fact, God said that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. But we are plagued by fear, false evidence appearing real, and fear just keeps us paralyzed and keeps us trapped because it is a yoke 
And so when you say the yoke is on you, that's pretty serious. Amen? Fear. Bitterness. Bitterness is a yoke. Somebody's been wrong. Somebody's been hurt. Pain. All the pain in their heart and their spirit. And so they have this root of bitterness. And that root of bitterness also leads us to another yoke, which is a, a yoke of unforgiveness. And understand something, because you are yoked by that bitterness or that unforgiveness, you're not hurting the person that you're choosing to be bitter towards. You're not hurting the person you're choosing to, unforgi- to, to, to forgive. You're hurting yourself. Your unforgiveness is keeping you captive and are not allowing you to walk in the victory and the freedom that Christ has give, came to give you and I. You're, 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 you choosing to forgive actually unlocks you and the person that you are unforgiving to. It unlocks them as well. That's the yokes. Traditions of man can be a yoke. Let me just say this this morning. Aren't you thankful that God is not bound to traditions? Amen. I mean, I've been in other countries, and God doesn't move the same way he moves. In, uh, they don't have ritualistic ways. They, there's all kinds of different ways that God moves, and God's not bound by the traditions of man. So tradition can even become a yoke if we allow it to. Let's not get so married to anything that we're not, not afraid to just let it go and just let God move and have his way. I've joked with the worship team because I'm not stepping on any toes, although if it hurts your toes this morning, I'm not going to apologize. I've threatened to start preaching at 1010 after one song, and then everyone shows up halfway through the service, and the sermon's over, and then we worship. What tradition of man says you got to start with worship, you got to start with the offering, and then the pastor preaches. But nowhere in the Bible does it say, I can't preach first and we worship later. That's right. That's right. I know some pastors in other states, they actually do that. They preach first, then they worship. So I'll, it's coming, you watch. And it's going to be unexpected. You're going to show up and you're going to miss it. Right. Amen? Right. What? I, let, me not, let me not camp there. God's not bound to traditions. God is spontaneous. My, my wife, she, I, I'd like to plan and I plan things, but there's times where I, I drive her nuts because I'm like, hey, let's just go do something. What are we, we going to go do? I don't know. I'm a spontaneous person. I like being spontaneous. And I don't like going on vacation and having everything planned out for me. That's why I don't, uh, the only trip that I'm looking forward to that's been planned for me is the one that my wife and I are going on with our district this, at the, in January when we go to Israel. That plan has already been planned for us, and I don't mind that plan, but let's go on vacation. Don't tell me where I'm going at 2 o'clock. <laughs> Amen? I want to go where I want to go at 2 o'clock. But, cause God, and God is spontaneous. Who says that at 12 o'clock everything better be done? Who says that 11, uh, the, the worship team should be done at a certain time in the order of service? That's the tradition of man. God's spontaneous. What if God breaks out in the middle of Walmart with Brother Gabe and he's working for Pepsi, he's at Walmart. What if God breaks out spontaneously in, the, in aisle number seven? God's spontaneous. The reason why God's not so spontaneous in many of our lives is because we have God in our little tiny boxes. And so we just need to remove the yoke. Amen? Amen? So the presence, write this down if you're taking notes. The presence of a yoke proves the absence of the anointing. The presence of a yoke proves the absence of the anointing. So this morning we're going to get into this and, and I've, got, I've got all day. Amen? No, no, we're going to go until the Lord says, but I want to get into this because I've, I've heard it my whole life. I've said it, I've, pre- I've preached it, I've believed it, that the yoke, of, the, the yoke of bondage, that the anointing breaks the yoke of bondage. And uh, you've heard me say over and over, I'm tired of seeing folks come in one way and leave in the same way. I'm tired of folks accepting Christ and then a week later, two, a year later, they're still acting the same. And why is that? Because they have a yoke in their life. Amen? A yoke in their life, something they're bound by. And so this morning, the first thing I want us to look at is, number one, yoke-breaking anointing. A yoke-breaking anointing. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, speaks about this yoke being destroyed. The prophet Isaiah is speaking about a yoke-destroying anointing that was going to be introduced to mankind. Now, when something is destroyed, 
Anyone ever had something get destroyed in, at their home? Anybody ever had something destroyed and it just magically came back? Jonathan and I have been in two wrecks. Both times, the vehicle was totaled, destroyed. But we weren't. Miraculously, we lived through it. They thought we were dead on the last one, but we came out. No scratch. But when they said that that vehicle was totaled, that meant that vehicle was beyond repair. That meant that vehicle was now completely so destroyed that they weren't going to pay to have it fixed and repaired. And so when we're reading Isaiah 10, we're looking at the context in which Isaiah is so clearly and cleverly uh, communicating to you and I, that whenever there is a yoke, the anointing of God, when it comes upon that yoke, it totally destroys that yoke and it cannot come back. That is a yoke-breaking anointing. So often we have the presence of God in a service. And we have tears and we have folks, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about what happens at the altars. But why are we coming and we're in the presence of God, the anointing of God is there. Why are we choosing to take that yoke back with us? That's good. That's good. Why? Fear says, I can't, I can't, I've got to take it with me. Right. Fear says, I can't leave it at the altar. My gosh, we have a yoke-breaking anointing that's available to you and I. Amen? Yoke-breaking anointing. It's the anointing of God. When something's destroyed, it cannot be fixed, it cannot be repaired, it can't, it can't be restored. It has been totally done away with. Friends, when we truly accept Christ... When we truly accept Christ, understand, not when we truly accept Christ, I mean, I'm saved and saved to the bone. When we truly accept Christ, we experience that anointing. We are free from addictions. We're free from oppression. We're free from depression. We get, some need to get free from unhealthy thoughts and religious mentalities. I take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ because my mind is no longer yoked. I can't think like that anymore. I don't think like that. And when I hear gossip, I squash it because I'm not going to go there anymore. Because that yoke destroyed, that, that, that anointing has destroyed that yoke of bondage in my life. We, we nip it. We, we just deal with it. And I'm talking about an anointing that changes you so that when others look at you and they say, what happened to you? You can boldly declare that it was the anointing of God that came in and destroyed these yokes in my life. Yeah, but look, last year you were addicted to pornography. Yeah, but I'm not that person anymore because the, the, God, the anointing of God destroyed that yoke that was in my life. Yeah, but you were about to leave your husband. You were about to leave your wife. Yeah, that was three months ago, but I got a hold of God and the anointing of God come and destroyed that thought in my life. Amen? And you can tell everyone it's the anointing of God that's done this in my life. And now I'm free to serve God. And when you have been set free, you're not going to worry. You're not going to be concerned about what other people think about you when you're dancing in the presence of God. When you've been really set free, you're not going to worry about what others say about you. Think, I was in, I was in the bank yesterday. I don't know this lady. And she's a, she's a teller. Said she used to go to this church many, many, many years ago with Pastor Tim Harrell, was pastor here. And she said, Pastor Osteen, right? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, uh, I've heard, I hear great things going on about at your church. I said, yes, ma'am, God's doing some awesome things. Then she said, Pastor, you stay focused. Don't let what others are saying about you bother you. And I just smiled at her and I said, I'm not. But I walked away. I'm like, what in the world? This lady doesn't go to our church. She doesn't know me. And how? Let them talk. Good Lord, let them talk. You know, because I've under, I understand something about the anointing of God. It doesn't make sense to other people. And what, one, what some people will call arrogant, what some people will call cocky, what some people will call this or that, God calls his anointing. That's right. And God calls his authority. Yes. You're walking in his authority and you're very humble and you walk in that humility and let people talk. Yeah. I really don't care. 
Because all I care about is being a pleaser of one person, Jesus Christ, and honoring the, and walking in a manner that's worthy of the calling he's placed on my life. Well, if you would just get, if you would stop looking at me and get a hold of the anointing of God that will destroy your bondage and destroy your yoke, you'll give other people something to talk about too. Amen? Let's give them something to talk about. No, I'm not going to sing. Hallelujah. I love, I love what Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 tells us. For, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. What does stand firm, therefore, mean? I'm going to stand. You can say what you want to say. You can hit me if you want to hit me. You can try to derail me. You can try to move me, but I'm standing. I'm not hanging in there. I, that hanging in there word's got to go out of our ver, ver, vocabulary because God didn't call nobody to a hanging party. He called us to stand. I'm standing in there. I'm not hanging on by a thread. I'm not just barely hanging. I'm standing in there. My bills may be mounting up. I don't have enough money to pay at the end of the month, but I'm st- I paid my tithe. God, you said if I pay, if I give my tithe, I'm, I'm standing in there. My, things may not be going right at work. Things may not be going good at, at, at my home or my, with my family. I'm I'm still standing in there. I'm not going to move. I'm standing. Why? Because Christ has set me free. And so because he set me free, he's given me an anointing and I can stand there and I can stand firm. And it says to stand firm, therefore, and then the last part of Galatians 5, 1 says, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Do you understand, church, that every time you flirt with who you used to be. You are flirting with that yoke of slavery that Christ died to set you free from. When you want to go, why in the world? The, the Israelites wanted, they, well, we should have gone, went back to Egypt. We have, at least we got this and this. Why would you ever want to go back to that stupid state of mind that you used to live in? Why would you want to go back to who you used to be? There's a coming out party when Jesus Christ comes into your life and that anointing has come upon you and it's destroyed that yoke. Do not go back to who you used to be. He who the Son says free is free indeed. Well, if we believe that, let's live free indeed. What is your yoke? And if you say it's your husband or your wife, it could be, it could be a good yoke. Because Jesus even said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you. He said that. And so if you have two people that are living for Jesus, sold out, set free in the name of Jesus, and they're yoked together, that's a powerful couple. Amen. You know, I've loved my wife for uh, 20, well, we've been married 22 and a half years, but we've been together for over almost 25. I know I don't look older than 35, but it's okay. (laughs) And as awesome of the, as all the things that we've seen God do in our life all these years has been amazing. But I'm just going to tell you right now, we know that God's allowing us to walk in a stronger anointing today than we ever used to walk in years ago. And I am loving who we are becoming more and more today than we, who we ever used to be. Because you, I don't know if you heard her get up and speak after service last week. Y'all have yet to see, hear, see or hear my wife come unglued in the power of the Holy Spirit. She's just been quiet. She's been nice to y'all. She's been really s- subdued. But you just wait. She's been sitting on it. And the Lord's calling it out of her again. I'm telling you. Amen. And then you already say that, oh, pastor, won't you let your boys preach? They preach better than you do. That's true. Out of our family, the, I'm, the, I'm the least... I'll turn them loose on everybody. I'll just sit back and cheer them on. What is your yoke, though? Think about it. Maybe it's something someone said about you as you were growing up. They said you were worthless. They said you were too fat. You were too ugly. They said you were all this, that you would never be more than you are, that you're always going to be the way you, way you are today. They said you were going to be abusive like your mom or like your dad. They said you're going to be poor. They said you're going to be all this. You're always going to be trailer trash. You're always going to be a redneck. You're always going to be this or that. They tried to put a label on you, and maybe that's your yoke. 
Or maybe, maybe it's because of something that someone did to you in your past. Maybe you were molested. Maybe you were abused or rejected or abandoned and left, to, left just to be you. Maybe that's your yoke. Maybe, maybe it was a personal failure that the devil continues to remind you of. You failed at something in your past and the devil keeps coming to you and whispering in your ear, telling you that you're, you're never going to be successful. You're never going to come out of poverty. You're never going to be anything other than a failure. I, although God has set me free from some of those things, most of those things, it, when, I, when I talk this, when I go into this, I can still hear words of a stepdad saying you're a waste of my money and a waste of the gas that I put in my tank to take you to anything. And I don't know where he's at today, but I would love to look him in the eye and say, you lied. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You lied. What is your yoke? Maybe the doctors told you you would always be who you, who you would have to live with that issue, like the woman with the issue of blood. Maybe, maybe the doctor said you would always have cancer. You would always live a certain way because that's hereditary. What is your yoke? Maybe others have said, it's okay for you to end this relationship because just go get another one. And maybe that yoke is the pattern that you have not changed in your life yet. You know, I've noticed something with people, they marry, that have, and if you've ever had a divorce, I, I'm, look, I, my family, the tree is not just crooked, it's like very huge and dysfunctional. And so I know that God heals through divorces. But I was afraid to ask my wife to marry me because I saw divorce modeled before me. And so my, I, someone has to break that pattern in their life. Someone has to get up under the anointing of God and allow that anointing to, be to, to destroy that yoke so that their children will never know the word divorce. Yeah, right. Amen. Someone's got to be willing to get on their face before a holy God and say, God, if you don't anoint me, if you don't anoint my marriage, if you don't anoint my, my family, if you don't anoint me, this thing's going to fall apart. Someone's got to get that bold. Amen? And I promise you God will respond to that hunger. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself to get that yoke off your neck so you can walk free and be who God intended you to be. Amen? Secondly, you've got to understand that Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus, Messiah, means the anointed one. He, he represents and he's everything and we, we're to be like him, right? It's not Jesus. Jesus is kingdom authority. And Jesus, if he, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the grave now dwells within you and I. Jesus said that greater works than these will you do in my name. But we're not doing these greater works because we are bound by these yokes. And so often I see folks in church, even here this morning, will worship God. But then when we're asked to take a step of faith because of shame and guilt on who we used to be, we don't feel like we're qualified. Well, bless God, God, he, God, God never calls the qualified, amen? He calls the unqualified, and then he qualifies them with what? His anointing. Amen. His anointing will qualify you. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it'll be on the screen. Jesus, the anointed one. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with what? Power. Power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. <coughs> who anointed Jesus? God. Jesus was anointed to the bone. All who heard him marveled at the authority he spoke with. I did a funeral yesterday for uh, Assembly of God pastor's wife, and many of you know her, Sister uh, Eula Kazi. Her husband, Cecil, pastored Lone Pine Assembly of God many, many, many years ago. He actually died at the pulpit on a Wednesday night after he got through preaching. And you guys, many of you know his son, their son, Jack Kazi, and Renee, and many of them. But as I was doing, preparing for her message, for the, her funeral, I was thinking, my gosh, what anointing these folks walked in. What anointing, because I never heard anyone speak 
any negative word about their life or her life. In fact, all of her kids said, Pastor, we don't want to tell you what to say, but our mama was the epitome of a virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. And I've known her, I've known Sister Kazi for, what, four years? And I got to say, that's exactly who she was. What anointing. It's anointing. And it's destroying yokes of bondage. And whenever they would, they told me that whenever she would speak, people would listen. Listen, there's a lot of people standing on stages and platforms today with a microphone, but people aren't listening to them. That's why I've even said, I've told you that I'm really protective on who comes and ministers in our church. Why? I'm not protective of the pulpit. I've got to protect the anointing that God's given to this house. And I'm not about to prostitute the anointing that God's given to this church. I'm not not about to let just anybody come in and stand on the stage. I don't care how eloquent they are. I don't care how well-spoken they are. I want to know, are they anointed of God? Amen? Do they have an anointing? I don't care how loud they shout. I don't care how quiet they are. My my question is, is, are they anointed? Because I've, eno- I've heard enough of speakers. I'm looking to, I want to hear anointed communicators for Jesus Christ. Men or women. Hello. Amen. Men or women. I don't care if they're a man or a woman. If they're anointed, then let them speak. I thought she was coming to speak. Hallelujah. <laughs> All who heard Jesus marveled at the authority that he spoke with. It was the anointing that gave him that boldness. People were astonished at his miracles, and it was because of the anointing of the Holy Ghost that he could do wonders. They were in awe when he cast out demons, and they would come out crying. They were in awe. It was the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that enabled Jesus to raise the sick, or heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out demons. It was the power of the, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's why even our fellowship is founded on this scripture. That's why this scripture comes into play. It's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit, says the Lord. I I pray every time I come to this platform, God, remove every bit of Jack Osteen. If you don't anoint me, I don't want to go. I don't want to just get up and say something. I want to know that it has been said by you. That's why you can sit in this service and some of you even get a little upset and wonder, has he been in my house? (laughs) God doesn't send me your email. He doesn't send me your your garbage or your junk. If if something is resonating with you anytime you enter the, the house of God, understand it's the anointing of God and the power of God that is revealing that word that you need. Amen? So if you get mad because pastor said something, get glad in the same shoes you just got mad in. Hallelujah. You got to love me, right? Thank you for three of y'all that love me. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say this. You are anointed. You don't believe me? You are anointed. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. But you have been what? By the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Woo! We read in Old Testament, Hosea, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. We read right here in 1 John chapter 2, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and now you have knowledge. The Apostle John told the church that we have an unction. That word unction translates into the word anointing. John tells the church that we have an unction, an anointing from Jesus. Friends, if you are a born-again believer, there is an anointing that is on your life. I don't mind praying for folks. What I mind is, is that when there's an expectation for pastor to stop everything else that he's trying to do for everybody else in the church and show up just to come pray... For you, you know why I get a little upset? I'm not, not upset because Caitlin is anointed. Right. Pastor Jessica is anointed. And there's time, I've said this before, I don't just let anybody pray for me. I, don't, I want somebody anointed praying for me. 
Amen? So there are, you are anointed. Come on, you mamas, when your baby's sick at home, that anointing, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we've already given them the Tylenol. We've already given, and they won't stop diarrhea, and they won't stop throwing up. Father, would you heal them in the name of Jesus? It's that anointing that you have. When your husband is not living the way he's supposed to live, wives, you're praying over his pillow. You're praying over where he's sleeping. You're praying over in that rocking chair where, he's, where he sits or that recliner. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you move in his life? You enter into a new house. You anoint that with oil. Do, do, do people still do that? Yes. I mean, I remember we pastored in Chapel, Nebraska, the panhandle of Nebraska, and we moved into a parsonage. And you would think parsonage would be clean, spiritually clean. No, I didn't take anything for granted. I'm like, Lord, I'm anointing this place. I don't know how, what this other pastor was like. I don't know what his life, wife was like. I'm, we anointed the house when we move in anywhere. Father, we anoint this house in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over this place. That may sound weird to you, but it's a whole lot better than evil spirits coming into my house. Amen? Right. This thing's a real deal because the anointing is real. You know, why the, you know why the enemy fights the anointing so hard? Because he knows how powerful the anointing of God is. He knows the anointing. How, it's, the, it's the anointing that sends him running. It's the blood that sends him running. God gave you this anointing when you received Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. If you've never received Jesus as Lord and your Savior, you're not anointed. But you, that can change today. Amen? We need to quit playing church and start tapping into the anointing that Jesus Christ has given us. I was given a, a message the, a Wednesday night during our service. I believe it was, it was Jeremiah. He, the Lord showed him something that people were playing, and Jesus, they were playing with Jesus on a cross, and they were throwing him up and seeing how far they would let him come down before they would catch him and how far, how far they would get before they actually dropped him. And, and, and he was like, Lord, what is this about? And so the Lord clarified what he meant, that people were actually playing with their salvation. They were seeing how, how much they could get away with and still be a Christian. How much they could do and still have one foot in the world and one foot in the, in the kingdom. Come on, we got to come all in, amen? And we, you, won't, you will never destroy the yokes that are in your life if you got one foot in the church and one foot in the world. you got to make a decision. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. We need to quit playing around with this thing called Christianity. We talked about that last week. The third thing I want us to look at this morning is the empowerment of the anointing. What does it do? What does it do? The anointing will give you boldness to speak what God is saying. The anointing will destroy, annihilate, demolish yokes of bondage. What about the hem of Jesus' garment? Was Jesus anointed? Did the woman touch Jesus? She touched his hem. Was it transferable? Was she healed? She was healed, the Bible says, of an issue, of an internal bleeding issue she had for over 12 years. That's what the anointing does. What about Peter? What about, was it Peter's shadow? Was Peter anointed of God? And so when the shadow walks by, what happens? People get healed. What about Paul and his handkerchief? His handkerchief, Paul was anointed. Demons were cast out. The anointing of God is real. I was at Teen Challenge in Dotson sometime, several months back, and I was preaching, and one of the young men there, he, it was on a Wednesday night, he waited until the whole service was over, and he come up to me, and he said, he told me his name. I'll never forget him. He was dressed real nice, three-piece suit on a Wednesday night. He said his name was Joseph, and he came out of a Presbyterian church. I'm like, wow, Presbyterian, and you're in a service like this. This has got to be world-changing for you, life-changing. Nothing against my Presbyterian friends, but they just, they have, their services are a little different than ours. He said, I want your anointing. 
I said, you can't have it. (laughs) Because you haven't been through the hell I've been through to get it. I said, nor have I been through the hell that you've been through to walk in the anointing that God has for you. Because I said, young man, you are anointing. And yes, the anointing is transferable. And I'm going to pray with you right now that you would receive the anointing that God has for you. Because I never suffered from drug addiction or alcohol addiction. So therefore, you have, you have an anointing to go and talk to others that are addicted in that to help them come out of that. Amen? So, you, so I prayed with him. And I hope and pray. I haven't seen or heard about him since, but I hope and pray he's walking in that anointing. The prophet Elisha. I'm going to ask you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 21. This blows me away. This blows my mind. I've read this story so many times. I've looked at it. And man, this is so powerful to me. Read this and see if it says to you what it says to me. And as a man was being buried. That means someone died, right? You tracking with me? No one's getting buried if they're not dead. As a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. (coughs) And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Talking about ghosts in the graveyard. Woo! Elisha's dead. He's bones. Them bones, them bones, them bones. This guy dies. They throw him in the grave. And as soon as his body touches the bones of Elisha, the guy jumps back up to life. Wow. The prophet Elisha was so anointed that even when he was dead and buried, they threw a dead man into his grave and the man got up when he touched Elisha's bones. Wow. You say the anointing is not real? It's real, and it's for you. What are you anointed to do? Well, go with me to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. Do we have that up there? No, sir? You said no? Isaiah? Let's go. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. Love this. It's also found in the New Testament. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. What are you anointed to do? You're anointed to preach. Well, I'm not called to be a pastor. That's okay. But you are anointed to preach. Every single one of us in this room this morning and even those that are not, You are anointed and called of God to preach the gospel. A lot do not preach because they get it confused, they get it twisted, and they think, well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not on the prayer team. I'm not this. I'm not on the worship. I'm not, I don't have a title. Can we just get past titles? I mean, good, good Lord. Who gives a rip what's in the front of your name or behind your name? You're a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. If Christ is in you, the King of glory is in you, you are a servant of Christ. You're a minister of the gospel. Not apostle, you don't have to be apostle this, missionary this, pastor this, pastor that. You are called to preach the gospel. Everywhere you go. That's a great command. The great commission is to go into all the world. We should, we're, we should be on the G, working on the O, and we should be going everywhere. Compelling them to come to Jesus Christ. Preach the gospel. St. Francis of Sisti said to preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. So how do you preach the gospel? You preach it by your lifestyle as well. An example that you live before people, before all men, you let your light shine. You're the salt of the earth. And understand something, salt stings sometimes. But salt also heals, salt cures. We're called to preach. The Holy Spirit will anoint you to preach good news. And I'm going to be honest with you. For those that I know in here, I've seen your social media posts. We're preaching. Amen. Amen. Some people are not preaching good news, though. We're preaching. 
come on, McCann, uh, what's his name, McCann passed away. Can we just, when you post about that, can you just honor what he did for our country instead of giving your opinion about him? I mean, our political uh, party and a political agenda, can we just say, let's pray for our president instead of giving your opinion about our president? Let's pray for the Republicans. Let's pray for the Democrats instead of giving your opinion about it. And then we want to give an excuse as to why we need to excuse ourselves and why we need to defend ourselves on where we stand with things. Good Lord, when you get to heaven, Peter's not going to say, were well, you Republican or Democrat? That's right. <laughs> Jesus is not going to look at you and say, how'd you vote? How'd you stand on this issue or that issue? Come on. You're anointed to preach the gospel. Not preach negative words, negative things. Promote good news. Blessed are the feet who brings good news. I wish, there, I wish this morning we had some preachers in this place that would preach and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Because when I look at our church, whether you're visiting or not, if you're a visitor, I'm, I'm glad you're here. We welcome you. But understand, someone asked me this past week, Thursday, how do I know what God's called me to do? I said, sister, it's real easy. God's called you to preach the gospel. Now, the purpose and how you do that, you need to understand that we have a growth track that will help you define and understand and discover the gifts that God has given you on how you accomplish that. Don't be afraid of the growth track. In the growth track, discovery is made. Amen? My wife is a great teacher, and she's anointed to teach that, so get in and get up under it and understand it. So the, what are you called to do? You're called to preach the gospel. God's anointed you to preach the gospel, to live as an example of Christ. You need the anointing. Anointing is the power of God that breaks yokes. Anointing is the power of God that destroys stubborn burdens. Anointing is the power of God that makes you stronger than the strong man who wants to destroy your life. Anointing is the power of God that disgraces Goliaths, Herods, Pharaohs, and other oppressors. Anointing is the power of God that breaks chains of oppression. Anointing is the fire of God that consumes any other power that tries to come against you. Anointing is the power of God that pushes children of God into, into breakthrough. A while ago, Sister Angeline, she said something about the word verge. I'm on the verge. Sometimes we, and you got to understand something, many of you are on the verge of something, but your, your, the, your rebellion and your stubbornness are keeping you just on the verge and not actually stepping in. His anointing is trying to propel you. His anointing is trying to get you to the next level. And you're on the verge of breakthrough. You're on the verge of healing. You're on the verge of restoration. But you're stubborn. As a church, we're on the verge of something greater. On the verge of something. Come on, how many of you sense and feel that you're on the verge of something different than you've ever experienced? You're on the verge you're on the verge. Anointing is the power that gets you from the verge to the next step. Anointing comes from God. You and I can't cast out devils in our name. And all, Satan is running amok in churches across this state, across this land. And we're trying to cast him out with our power. Anointing casts out devils. Anointing comes from God. Anointed, an, an anointed person is a spiritual person. An anointed person is filled with the Holy Spirit. Without the anointing, a Christian will not be able to perform miracles. It's God who performs them, but it takes an anointed person of God to be his hand and his feet. When the Spirit of God falls on you, it makes you become a candidate of signs and wonders. I don't know about you, but I just don't want people singing just to sing. I want anointed people ushering in the presence of God on our platform. Fourthly, cast off the yoke. We've talked about the enabling power. If you're, the anointing is given to enable you to do something. If you're not doing anything for God, it doesn't matter how much noise you make. Look at 1 Samuel 16 verse 13. I'm almost done. This, then Samuel took the horn of oil and did what? 
anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now, Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. David had a premature anointing to be king, and it was very difficult for him. Other people, especially King Saul, didn't understand it. He was anointed, David was anointed for a kingdom that he hadn't come into yet. And he was dressed up like a shepherd boy, smelling like sheep dung, but anointed to be the king. Where's my teenagers out here this morning? Young people. Here, listen to me. Do not wait until others tell you that you're of the right age to start operating in the anointing that God's placed on your life. Do not wait. That's why I'm standing behind cheering on my sons. That's why I'll turn my pulpit over to either one of them. Because I know there's an anointing on their life. I can't, we can't sit back and wait for them to be of the right age. What's the right age? Joan of Arc was what, 14 years old? When she did what she did. The right age. So don't wait until you have to, don't, don't wait until the world tells you to be the right age to operate in your anointing. Can I say this to the adults that are in this house? If you are waiting for me to ask you to do something and you're not going to walk in the anointing that God's given you because you're waiting on me, good Lord, you're going to be waiting for a while. Amen? When I go someplace, I'm, I'm secure in who I am. I'm secure in the calling that God's placed on my life. I'm not going to wait for someone to ask me to do something. I know what I'm called to do. Amen? And so I've got to be obedient. I've got to walk in that calling. Don't wait to walk in your anointing. Get up under someone. Maybe you don't have it all figured out yet. Maybe That's why it's called mentorship. That's why it's called coaching and helping someone cultivate the gifts that are within them. That's why you need to get into a connect group. Hello. No one said amen. amen. Get in a connect group because you're going you're gonna to be anointed but you're going to learn how to walk in that anointing and help others in that. Understand something. Teenagers, back to you. The devil is fighting your generation so hard because you're the next in line to usher in the greatest move of God this world's ever seen. That's right. That's right. I believe that. Yes. The devil knows that you are anointed and he wants to mess you up before you even ever step into your role. We got to refuse to compromise, church. Don't compromise the anointing. Samson compromised his anointing in Judges 16. He, it, it said, um, he, he laid his head down in the lap of Delilah one last time. And they, she said, Samson, Samson, wake up. She'd already cut his hair. And the Bible says that Samson did not even know that the presence of God had departed. That's a sad place when you don't even know that God's presence lifted off your life. He compromised the anointing. Lastly, he's the yoke breaker. The yoke breaker. Jesus is the yoke breaker. He broke the yoke off of a poor, broken, hopeless man beside the pool of Bethesda. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus tells this man, even though this man had many yokes, different yokes, Jesus shows up one glorious day and says to him, Rise, take up your mat, and walk. Do you know how long this man had sit there? 38 years. 38 years this man had sat there in his misery, sat there in his pain, sat there in his brokenness, sat there in his neglect, sat there in his rejection, sat there while watching others go by him. Jesus shows up, and in 38 seconds, the man is changed forever. That's what the anointing will do. Yoke-breaking weapons. I'll close with this. God has given us access to yoke-breaking weapons. You ready for the first one? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. The name of Jesus is a yoke-breaking weapon. There's times you don't know what to say. And all you can say is, Jesus! Jesus! 
The devil trembles at the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Another weapon that God has given us to break yokes off of our life is the Word of God. The Word of God. How many of you have seen your life changed and transformed this year just because you chose to read the Word of God through the year, through the year with us? Amen. Amen. Come on. The Word of God has the power to transform and change people's lives. Another weapon that you have is the blood of Jesus. Jeremiah was about four, three or four years old. He, would, he got up and he would come into our bedroom and say, Mom and Dad, I see two red eyes at the end of my bed. And we would pray. I got up and I went in his room and I said, Satan, you got to go. You can't mess with the, my son. You're not going to mess with his sleep. I'd go back and I got back in the bed. A little bit later, Jeremiah would come back in. Daddy, I still see those two red eyes at the foot of my bed. Come on, Satan, don't mess with your kids. And I got up and I went back in. I'm like, Satan, you've got to go. You're not messing with my son. Let him get some sleep. You've got to go. About 30 minutes later, Jeremiah comes back in. He says, Daddy, those two eyes are still there. And then it dawns on me. I wasn't praying right. And I went into the room and I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus over my son and his bedroom. You've got to go. He can't, you, can't, you can't be in here. And at that, from that moment, until they were old enough to start walking in their own anointing, we still pray for them, but we're not in their bedrooms anymore. But because we practiced it every night before they went to bed, singing over them, praying over them, declaring the promises of God over them, and, just, and pleading the blood of Jesus and speaking the name of Jesus, Satan cannot mess with their dreams or their thoughts or their mind. Amen. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Another weapon that God has given you and I is one that we don't like to participate in, but it is very powerful. Fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer. Two spiritual disciplines that if I promise you, if you start operating them, you're going to see things change and transform in your life. And then here's one. This weapon is very, very powerful. One that people need to start engaging in and using on a daily basis. Praise and worship. Praise and worship. Your praise confuses the enemy. Your praise confuses the enemy. I don't know what they're so thankful for. They got this, this, and this going on in their life. I sent this towards them. I sent that towards them. But my gosh, how many of you have been enjoying reading the book of Job this month? That dude, man, his integrity stayed in check. His devotion to God stayed in check. He might have had some questions, but he did not. He refused to curse God. Praise and worship. I know my Redeemer lives. Are you kidding me? You just lost everything. You've lost it all. And you're shaving your head. You're falling down. My Redeemer lives? Are you serious? You should curse God and die. Another weapon. I promise you if you practice this, your life's going to change financially too. Giving. Giving is a weapon that will destroy the yoke of poverty off of your life. Well, pastor, I can't afford to give. You can't afford not to. You can't afford. It's not your money. It's not your money. It's not your money. It's not your money. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not my money. Because if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't have it anyway. And he's telling you to give and to give joyfully with a cheerful heart, not begrudgingly. Give joyfully and cheerfully. And God's going to change it. The last weapon and a very powerful weapon. We need this in our life. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Sister Debbie, if you guys would make your way. The Holy Spirit.